Seth Fransman joins me, Middle East security analyst based in Jerusalem um, and an adjunct fellow at the Foundation for Defence of Democracies. Good afternoon to you, Seth. Yes, hi, good afternoon. There's a few things to to go at there, really, aren't there? Should we start with that Israeli military intelligence uh, chief resigning? Um, What's the significance of that, do you think? Well, I think it's the most high-level resignation so far in six months since October 7th, since the, the attack. And obviously, when it comes to military intelligence, I mean, that's a key component of the intelligence apparatus of the state of Israel. So the fact that they did not, you know, seem to predict or, or have the the warnings that were necessary to keep more soldiers on the border on that day and prevent, you know, an unprecedented massacre, massacre of people, the worst killing of Jews since the Holocaust. I think it makes sense, you know, that he was a target in terms of, of resignation, but it's just one person, you know, out of a whole series of people, I think, that, you know, many of the public would like to see be held to some sort of account or see a, a full investigation um, and obviously, some of the political echelon has refused to take basically any responsibility. Mm. And has the, it, does the fact that the war is continuing mean that questions of accountability for those failings um, are simply not being asked yet? Well, that's kind of the message discipline that was put in place right after, after October 7th was that we can't investigate the war while the war is going on. But I don't think historically it makes much sense because I think, you know, if you have a commander who fails – Historically, those commanders uh, do face consequences or are relieved of command. So the idea that you don't investigate anyone would seem to mean that this, the failures you have on October 7th can just keep perpetuating themselves. So I think that even though that may benefit those in charge, and it may have initially made sense because you don't want a chaos in command when you're fighting a, a vicious terrorist organization, at some point – you have to just you have to see you know who failed and who didn't, and and learn from those mistakes. And might this move um, by uh, General Aaron Haliva might it destabilize things for Netanyahu? I don't think it will necessarily destabilize things yet for Netanyahu. I mean, it may start. To, it may be the first crack in a kind of in the dam in, in the sense of letting. Well, more and more people will then start to feel they can speak up and start to either resign or call for resignations. And eventually, you know, that would go to the man in, at the top. And that that's where the buck has to stop eventually. So the fact that he has taken, I think, as far as I can tell, almost no responsibility for October 7th, eventually those will be serious questions. But that will have to be answered in election because it's he's been he's made it clear that he will, of course, not resign. Uh, and back to the the question of um, the situation in Gaza at the moment. We know that um, attacks are continuing, don't we, on the ground? Yeah, they're still fighting in Gaza. I mean, the, the intensity has certainly been reduced. So the Israel Defense Forces have withdrawn a lot of soldiers compared to several months ago. There is, of course, talk of a when Israel might decide to launch some sort of offensive closer to Rafah, the last stronghold of Hamas in Gaza. And Hamas continues to try to fire rockets at Israeli cities and continues to try to attack uh, the Israeli troops that are positioned currently kind of in central Gaza. I I used the word sanctions earlier on and then kind of checked myself because there is, I I hadn't heard of this thing called the Leahy Law until this weekend. This is something America uses. It's an American law that addresses whether or not it will continue to militarily, financially support particular unit or particular uh, armies and units of armies. What's the deal there with the IDF and the Leahy Law? I assume the history of that is that, you know, the U.S. is involved, just like other Western countries, in training all sorts of militaries all around the world. And back in the day, of course, the U.S. was involved probably in training, you know, whether it's the South Vietnamese or training uh, groups in, you know, Latin Central America. So there was a preference to not have the U.S. involved in training, you know, some sort of group that are a squad or whatever that's involved in human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So Israel has come under scrutiny for that. It does seem to come out of the blue kind of this this sudden this talk we've heard about sanctioning this one unit and singling it out without, as far as I can tell, a lot of back and forth between Israel and the U.S. before about, OK, Israel, you need to do X, Y and Z or we're going to do this. So it seems like a bit symbolic or a token attempt to kind of say, OK, this is we'll single out this one unit. But in order to kind of talk about, you know, the issues that happened in Gaza and kind of writ large. Mm. And, you know, it it looks from the outside looking in as though any peace talks are on the back burner or not even on the burner at all. Um, what do we know? Peace talks with the Palestinians? Uh, yes, yes. 
I mean, I don't think it seems there can be peace talks at the moment because, you know, first of all, the Hamas continues to control Gaza and it vows to destroy Israel. And also in the northern West Bank, you have just near constant daily uh, fighting and attacks, not only against Israel, but between terrorist groups that are challenging the Palestinian Authority. So it's very hard to talk peace when the Palestinian Authority doesn't control um, either Gaza or most of the areas it's supposed to control. So I think, first of all, the international community has to make sure that the Palestinian Authority or someone will just displace Hamas and all these terrorist groups so that then there can be some sort of actual talks. Well, thank you. Good to talk to you. Seth Fransman, Middle East security analyst based in Jerusalem.